Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Olive Branch Baptist Church. We're so happy that you're with us this morning. Uh, we have a few announcements that we do want to share before we start. Uh, if you are a guest, we're so happy that you're with us this morning. Please uh, let us know you're here by filling out a Connect card that you can grab from the table that is uh, behind you, or you can also scan the mobile version on the back of the bulletin that you grabbed on your way in today. And also don't forget to grab a gift bag uh, from an usher or a deacon or from one of the pastors before you leave uh, today. Tonight uh, at 6.30, we are having our first uh, apologetics lesson in the fellowship hall. And so if you are alive and breathing to steal from Matt Marr, this is a class that is for you. Uh, so we hope that you are there uh, tonight. We'll have some refreshments and we'll talk about uh, the, role, the reliability of the Bible. So young and old, we hope to see you there tonight at 6.30 up in the fellowship hall. Uh, Wednesday, I'm still looking for some help with the Bracey Ray of Hope uh, food pantry of unloading and packing bags. So uh, YC aged kids, if you are free, uh, be free and go help us with that. You uh, can either meet me here at the church at eight, or if you would rather just go straight to uh, Bracey Ray of Hope, you can do that as well. I just need to know ahead of time if you're going to be there and you can either tell me directly today or you can sign up on the app. Uh, also, that were this coming Wednesday, uh, OBBC kids have your summer at the park event, and so you're going to meet at the park at six for food, for games, for kickball, and uh, a lot of other fun things as well. I'm looking forward to hopefully uh, not getting demolished by a bunch of ten year olds in kickball, but you know I'm old and tired. So parents, you're encouraged to stay and play as well. So we hope to see you there this coming Wednesday. We're still collecting for the Standing Rock missions trip. Uh, so any gift cards or checks that you might have to go towards uh, this missions, uh, just keep in mind that next Sunday is the last day to get those turned in because the trip is uh, right around the corner. Women on Mission are also collecting school supplies through the end of July. There's a supply list in the bulletin of some of the items that they are needing, and you can drop those items off uh, up at the Welcome Center. And then finally, I did the, uh, I guess not the math, I looked at the calendar and within four weeks, VBS and YC Week will have already been done. So this is coming really, really soon, whether we are emotionally and physically prepared or not. So we are still looking for some donations of little snacks to help us with that week, and it is coming up very soon. And so make sure that you not only get your kids signed up for VBS, but also if you're able to help out uh, to uh, get this for us. So that is everything that I have for us this morning. And so I think we're going to worship, or is Pete, or just Pete, Jim? All right, so we're going to worship together. So as the band is making their way up here, we're so happy that you're with us again this morning. We're going to sing 10,000 reasons, and there's more than that for us to bless the Lord this morning. Amen? Yes. Okay, let's go. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship His holy name. The sun. Up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing till the evening
We are here today to worship God. He is with us, but you're also with each other as brothers and sisters. So please welcome your brothers and sisters this morning to Olive Branch Baptist Church. Good morning, brothers and sisters. This morning I wanted to read from Psalm 87, a psalm that reminds us of the faithfulness of God and really the strength of God and the power of God. And uh, isn't it so comforting to know that there is no one, there's no thing in this universe that God is not in control of. And therefore, there's no one or no thing or anything in this universe uh, that God, that's more powerful than God. And so that's what this psalm teaches us and reminds us. So please listen as I read the first eight verses of Psalm 89. I will sing of the Lord's faithful love forever. I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. For I will declare, faithful love is built up forever. You establish your faithfulness in the heavens. The Lord said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build up your throne for all generations. Lord, The heavens praise your wonders, your faithfulness also, in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can compare to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? God is greatly feared in the council of the holy ones, more awe-inspiring than all who surround him. Lord, God of armies, who is strong like you, Lord, your faithfulness surrounds you. And one of our deacons, Pete English, would you come and pray for us, please? Let's pray. Our great God, we acknowledge that you are sovereign over all. We marvel to know that you created all that there is and that you rule over all of it that you control every aspect of human history and you control every aspect of our lives. But we also marvel to know that you have placed us into your world, that you have an amazing plan for our lives and a plan for our lives to be a part of your plan for all of history. We rejoice, our Heavenly Father, to know that you are a God who loves us and who cares for us, that nothing can thwart your plans for us. And so we say to our souls, sing like never before, we worship 
your holy name. We pray that that would be true in this hour as we worship you. But we pray that you would help us to continue to worship you in every aspect of our lives as we go out and go through the week to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Brother Pete. Y'all can stand up and continue to worship with us this morning. Uh, we're going to go a little bit out of order of what's in your bulletin. If you have one, we're going to do only a holy God. And, of course, Sam knows. And so you just follow the words on the screen. And we're, we're good. And we're just uh, so blessed to be in the house this morning.
Can I get an amen? <laughs> so we have been um, hearing this song on the radio for the last few weeks, and we decided in June that we were going to do this song in July, and we, we've been chomping at the bit because July couldn't come soon enough to do this. Um, it's a, a song by a band that we love listening to called We the Kingdom. They have a, a great testimony in their story and how they became um, a group and how they worship God through their music and the just the redemptive stories that uh, they tell uh, that God has done in their life. And um, their music just screams that theme. And this is one of those songs we were talking... <laughs> Wayne and I don't talk about what he's going to preach on or what scripture he's going to read, but this morning, the psalm um, just talks about this song in particular and uh, what Jesus does and how can Jesus save us from eternal hell if he didn't create everything here? He has to have that much power, amen? And so um, that's uh, what this song speaks to. And um, we're going to do that for you now. Hopefully you've heard it already. If not, guess what? You're going to hear it again next week, okay? Who tells the sun to rise every morning and colors the sky with the shades of his glory? Us with mercy and love, Jesus does. Who holds the orphan, comforts the widow, cries for injustice, feels every sorrow, carries the pain of his children, Jesus does. the Son, praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was, cause that's what Jesus does. Who understands the heart the sinner showers its grace over all our mistakes washes us clean with his blood Jesus does who sings the song of sweet forgiveness who stole the keys to hell and the grave who has the power to
Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we do praise your name this morning for our salvation, for your presence with us, and for your working in our lives to bring about our glorification, our presence with you in heaven forever. We are thankful people this morning. We are humbled people to know how much you love us and how much you have done for us. Lord, I pray now that you would open up our eyes to see your word, open up our ears to hear and to listen to it, and open up our hearts to obey it. And I pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. The verses we'll look at this morning in Romans chapter 8 are some of the most encouraging in Scripture, and so I just want to get right to them. So let's begin. Romans 8, 28. You've probably seen it in a poster you have it on a mug, you have it on a t-shirt, you have it uh, everywhere because it is such a comforting verse. You've probably used it in times that you needed help and comfort and you've shared it with those who are also in times of trial and suffering. For we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Let's look at this verse a little closer. This morning. The first thing, this promise is for Christians. Notice the qualifiers. It says, All things work for good for them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So it's those who love God, it's those who have been called by God. Those are the ones who can claim this promise. Uh, an unbeliever, God certainly still loves, cares for, he wants everyone to come to repentance and believe. But in their life, the things that are working out in their life is trying to bring them to repentance. And I wouldn't necessarily say that everything's happening in their life is happening for good. But for us Christians, everything that happens is happening for a purpose and happening for a reason. All things means all things. So think about that. Think about everything that happens in your life every day. The good things, the bad things, the insignificant things, the irrelevant things that seems to you, the things that give you joy, the things that bring sadness, the things you don't understand. Everything in your life, God is using. He's using it for a purpose. So this gives us comfort because we can never be in a moment in our life and say to God, this is useless, I don't need it, there's no point to it. Because everything is working out for something that's good. Now this is the important thing, it's good from God's perspective. You see, I can understand how sometimes we want everything to work out so that we have a comfortable life or to work out so that we are healthy and strong or we want things to work out so that we are well off financially so we don't have to worry about paying bills and making it from paycheck to paycheck. And I can understand how we want things to work out for good for our family so that they're always blessed, they're always happy. I know I understand why we would want that to be our good. But God's looking from his perspective and working it all out for good. So his definition of what good is, we'll see in a moment. And it should be our definition of good. But sometimes it's not. I hear it all the time in Christian families. I hear parents say all the time, all I want my child to be, I don't care what they become, whether they're a policeman, whether they're a teacher, whether they're uh, working at uh, fast food. I don't care what they're doing in their career or their life in the future as long as they are happy. That's not the perspective of God. I think we should change it to, I don't care what they're doing as long as they are holy. That should be what our goal is. And that is what we'll see in a moment is the good that we are talking about. This is important to know too, that even though God uses evil, he uses suffering and tragedy and hurt, God doesn't create any of it. 
It's not as though God says, I want Wayne to be this particular person, and so to make him that way, I'm going to bring hurt on him. I'm going to cause a disease in his body. I'm going to cause him to be in an accident. I'm going to do these things to him so that I can work them all out for good. No, God never sins. He never does anything that's evil. But he does have control over everything, and he does allow evil to happen. The book of Job teaches this perfectly. Remember, Job needed to learn a lesson. He needed to learn how to trust God. He was a very righteous man. But remember, Satan said to God, the only reason he worships you and he does what you say is because you bless him with so much stuff. Take away his stuff, and then, then he will curse you. So God, notice, had control over what happened to Job. But he was, God wasn't the one who did it. Job learned a lesson to trust God, even if he couldn't understand what was going on. He didn't know why he lost his children. He didn't know why he lost all of his wealth. He didn't know why he was suffering and had boils all over his body and he was scratching and trying to get relief. He didn't know why. And in the end, he trusted God that he didn't need to know why. All he needed was to know that God was in control. But for Job to get there, God used the death of his children, the stealing of his wealth, the suffering of his body, to get him to the point where he learned this lesson. But God didn't kill his children. God didn't steal his livestock. God didn't touch him and make him suffer and poor health. God didn't do any of that. Who did that? Satan did that. But remember, Satan wanted to, to do something. He had to ask permission from God. Now, I know people are saying, well, then, if that's the case, why does God allow anything to happen, right? If Satan's got to give, get permission, every time Satan comes and says, I want to kill, I want to steal, I want to do this, God just says, nope, you ain't doing it. Well, that would solve everything, wouldn't it? But also don't forget there's us, sinners. And for God to make this world a perfect place right now, he would have to, in a sense, make us all robots because we have a free will. We choose whether we want to do what's right or wrong. We choose whether to follow God or not. We are people who have a choice. And anytime we have a choice, we can choose to do evil. So it's not just Satan. In fact, we can never say, Satan made me do it. It's not Satan that did it. You were tempted maybe by him, but you did it. You chose. So with free will and free choice comes the choice to do evil. And so we ourselves do evil. Satan tempts to evil. Satan does evil with God's permission. But this is the great thing. God uses all of that, the good in our life, the evil in our life, to bring about good. It gives us comfort to know that he's in control of it all. It's not as though God and Satan are equals and they're battling head to head. And sometimes Satan wins and sometimes God wins. And one day we'll find out who the victor is. God is in control of Satan. He's in control of the evil that happens. He's in control of it all. Why does he allow any of it to happen other than the fact we have free will? We don't know, and we're to trust God. That's the lesson Job learned, because he never knew why he suffered. His lesson was to learn, trust God. God knows what he's doing. But don't blame God for the evil in this world. Here we learn what this good God is doing in our life is. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. The good that God is working out in your life is to do this, to conform you to the likeness of Jesus. 
to be Christ-like. So everything that happens in your life has a purpose. To bring you to that place where you are like Jesus. And God uses, again, all things to bring you there. So think about this. Jesus Christ is forgiving. How are you going to be a forgiving person if someone doesn't hurt you and you can forgive them? Okay? When you think about it, you can't be a forgiving person unless there's hurt. Again, God doesn't cause the sin. God doesn't cause the hurt that comes to you because someone sinned against you. But he uses that to make you a person who is like Jesus, who has forgiven us, and we're commanded to forgive as well. If you're going to be a patient person, as God is, isn't he patient with you? Certainly. If he wasn't patient with you, we'd all be dead. Because the first sin we commit, it would be enough to send us to hell. But he doesn't. He's patient with us, wanting us all to repent. When we do repent, he's patient with us so that we grow. But how can you be patient unless you have to wait? You you won't learn patience without waiting. And so do you see how God can use the evil and he can use the waiting in life to bring about in us a character that is Christ-like? And that is God's plan and purpose for us. That is the good that everything is working out toward. Now Paul goes on and he talks about this path of salvation. This gets complicated to understand. And in fact, I'll tell you, it's impossible to understand. Some people believe that God looks into the future. And when he looks into the future, he sees who is going to believe in him. And then he saves that person. And that's what they think of as foreknowledge. But really, as you read the scripture, it talks about God not doing that, but God is choosing us. He knows who he wants to choose, and then he chooses those who are going to be saved, and he saves them. Well, if you hear that, that doesn't sound fair. (laughs) If God is the one who's going and choosing people to be saved... That means the ones he didn't choose had no choice and they had no, nothing they could do about it because God didn't choose them. But the Bible also teaches this, that anyone who believes will be saved. And it teaches that everyone has a choice to believe or not. And remember we learned in Romans chapter 1, Paul said, there is no one who has an excuse. No one is going to be able to stand before God and say, God, I didn't believe in you because you didn't choose me. So it's not my fault. (laughs) In fact, it's your fault. No, no one will be able to do that. Remember, Paul taught us that God is evident in creation. And from that evidence alone, there is no one with an excuse. Those who see the creation believe there's a God. I believe God brings to them this message about Jesus. And then there's a choice to believe or not. So everyone who will be in hell will be there because they did not believe and they did not choose. It won't be because God sent them there as a predestined destination. The Bible talks about Christians being predestined for salvation The Bible never says that people are predestined for hell. And so I know it's impossible because it sounds like a logical puzzle to be solved. How can both be true? Logically, it seems impossible that it's both true that God chose us and we chose him. But this is the important thing to know. The message to anyone who is not a believer is always come to Jesus. That's always the message. Repent, believe, come to Jesus, and you will be saved. That's the only message that's given to those who are unbelievers. It's only to believers that God tells us, you know what? 
I had a plan for your life well before you even knew who I was. And it's always intended to be a comfort to us to know that God has a plan for our life. Isn't that comforting to know? Before you were even born, God had chosen you. Before he even created the world, he had chosen you. And so that moment that you made your free will choice to believe in him, God says, brother and sister, my children, I knew because I chose you. And this is the the important thing too, because God chose us and he saved us, he will complete that salvation by bringing us to heaven with him. And that's what Paul goes on to say. He talks about those that God foreknew, he predestined, he called them. The moment you believed, wasn't there a movement in your spirit to believe what you were hearing? To put your faith in Jesus Christ? That's the calling. Then you believed by faith and God declared you righteous. That's justification. Paul doesn't in this verse use the word sanctification, but maybe because sanctification has as much to do with us as it does God in a way. That's what all of chapter 8 to this point was about. We are to yield to the Spirit and be filled with the Spirit so the Spirit enables us and leads us and empowers us to live a righteous life. But one day we will be glorified. Our bodies will be changed from mortal ones that are weak and wear out to immortal ones that will live with God forever. And we will live in his presence in a perfect place for eternity. That will be the completion of our salvation. The point Paul is making is that if God saved us, he also chose us before we were saved, and he's going to complete our salvation by bringing us to the end. And that's what he goes on to say when he talks about how our salvation is secure. This is also a debatable issue among Christians. There are some Christians who will say, yes, God saves you, and then it's your job to make sure that you stay saved. So you have to watch what sin you do, or you may lose your salvation. You have to watch what you believe, or you may become an apostate and fall away from the faith. And so it's our job as Christians, they say, to live a righteous life, to believe what is true, so that we stay saved and we don't lose our salvation. The Bible teaches that it's not what we do to keep our salvation. It's what God has done to preserve our salvation. God is the one who did the work to save us, right? It was Jesus who died on the cross. It was God who justified us. We didn't do anything in that. And just as we did nothing to be saved and being justified, we don't do anything to secure our salvation so that we are glorified. Now, when people like myself teach that, the others who teach the other will say, now, wait a minute. So what you're saying is that if I walk an aisle and say a prayer, I can do whatever I want the rest of my life and I still go to heaven? No, that's not what the Bible teaches. I mean, nowhere in the Bible does it tell us do whatever you want. I don't know where they get that idea. I mean, logically, maybe it is true. Logically, if you are truly saved then nothing you can do is going to separate you from God. And so you will go to heaven and you will be glorified. But the Bible doesn't talk in logical puzzles. The New Testament teaches us as Christians, once you've been saved, now you're a slave to Christ. You're to live a righteous life. You're to say no to sin and yes to God. You are to humble yourself and you're to obey the commands of Jesus. That's how we show our love. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. The Bible teaches us that if we don't, we will be disciplined. And sometimes discipline can end in death. That's how seriously God takes sin 
and how seriously he takes it in the lives of his children. So I'm not teaching that you believe and then you can do whatever you want. We believe and then we are saved so that we can live for Christ. But it is true here that Paul is going to give us comfort to know what God started, he's going to finish. What, are the, what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died. But even more, he has been raised. He is also at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So Paul has some questions. Seven questions here. What then are we to say about these things? The things he's talking about. Maybe even going back farther, not just in the immediate verses, but all the way back from the very beginning. What can we say about these things, about salvation and about how Jesus has saved us and how the Holy Spirit lives in our life? What can we say about these things? Well, the answer is many things. And so he goes on to tell us. If God is for us, who is against us? Think about it. As I read in the song, as we have sung in our worship, God has created everything. He's in control of everything. If he is, how is there any person, any power, anything in this universe that's going to outpower him and then come and get us and destroy us? It, it can't. Not even Satan himself. So we have this promise that nothing can defeat us, nothing can separate us from our salvation in God. And he goes on to say why. He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? So think again, if God paid the cost of sending his son to die for us, think about that cost. I know it's hard to understand with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, how the Father sacrificed his son, how Jesus willingly gave his life. This sacrifice of coming to earth, of dying. If God was willing to do that, why wouldn't he be willing to finish what he started? You know, why would he save us only then to lose us? Why would he save us only so that when we come to the end of our life, we didn't quite make it and now we're going to hell? Why would he do that? He's not going to do that. If he went to the cost of sending his son, he's going to go to the cost of every effort to make sure that salvation is complete. And even more, give us everything. That's how much God loves us. Well, who will bring an accusation against God's elect? The only one who can truly accuse us. I know Satan goes around accusing us of sin before God. Well, the only one that can bring a real accusation that means anything is God himself. God could look at your life and say, you've sinned here, you've sinned there, you've sinned there, you've sinned there. And you need to pay for it. And he would be right. Since God's the one who would accuse, but he's the one who's justified us. He's declared us righteous. So we don't have to worry about the fact that we have sinned and we will sin. Our sin has been paid for. And God has said, I declare you a righteous person. So we don't have to fear God destroying us. He goes on to say, who is the one who condemns? 
Jesus is the judge. So again, he's really the only one that can, can condemn us. But he's the one who gave his life for us. So why would he condemn us when he died for us? Paul reminds us that he died on our behalf. He's been raised to life. He's exalted the right hand of God and he prays for us. So the only one we'd really need to fear would be God who could accuse us or Jesus who could condemn us. But Jesus has taken the judgment and he has taken the accusation and the condemnation for us so that we don't have to. And more than that, he's on our side. You know, he's there with the Father praying for us. Isn't that awesome? Last week we learned the Holy Spirit is praying for us. Here Jesus is praying for us. I mean, we pray together for each other, but the reality is as we pray for each other, God's praying as well. So again, do you see God's love here? If he's done these things for us, why would now he say, well, I did all that, but... You're on your own now and hope you make it. <laughs> that's, that's not how God is working. So the final question is, who can separate us from the love of Christ? And then he talks about suffering. He quotes Psalm 42. Because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Paul here references the fact that he was suffering and knows that we are suffering. And isn't it true that when we are suffering the most, we often feel most abandoned by God? I know it's also true when we're suffering the most, that's often when we call out to God. But when we're suffering and we're calling out to God and God's not responding, that's when we feel as though he's abandoned us. And I think this is the time in our lives when we feel that way the most. And that's why Paul mentions it. Because he's asking, what can separate us from the love of Christ? The thing that most of us struggle with is feeling as though God has left us and his love has left us when we are suffering. The disciples did that when they were in the boat on a storm on the lake. Remember where Jesus was? He was sleeping. The disciples said this to Jesus when they woke him up. Don't you care if we drown? They saw the suffering. They saw God wasn't helping. And they concluded God doesn't care. Brothers and sisters, that is never the case. And Paul's reminding us of that truth right now. Even in the worst of suffering, it has a purpose. And God is going to bring good out of it. And God still loves you. And he still cares for you, and he's still with you. And so Paul says, Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword separate us from God's love? He says, No. And all these things were more than conquerors. When I think about battle and a conqueror, you could be a conqueror and still be in pretty bad shape. Okay, so, so imagine if you had a, a fist fight with someone today and you were duking it out and both of you were throwing some good punches and in the end you won, you conquered. But you still may be in the hospital you know, because you got a broken hand, your face is all cut up, you got a bloody lip, your eyes swollen. Okay, so you, you're the conqueror, but you're still in bad shape. So Paul says, no, we're not just conquerors through Jesus Christ. We're more than that because we haven't just conquered. And Jesus conquered death and he conquered sin. And because we're united with him, we have victory over those. But we have more than that. We have everything, every blessing because of the love of Jesus Christ. And so he concludes Romans chapter 8 with this beautiful expression of the love of Christ. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created things will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Suffering won't separate us. Death, life, anything. Notice he says, nor any other 
created things. We ourselves can't even separate ourselves from the love of God. Aren't we a created thing? Yes. So brothers and sisters, Paul's joyful, comforting message to us today is this. God loved you so much that he chose you before he even created this world. He gave his own son to die for you so that you could believe and have eternal life. And because he gave his son, he will complete what he has started. And in your life right now, that is exactly what he's doing every day and everything that happens. He is transforming you into the likeness of his son. In the day he calls us home, either in our death or in the rapture, we will see God face to face and we will be perfect and we will be in the likeness of his son and our salvation will be complete. And there is nothing in this universe that will stop that from happening. Isn't that a joyful, comforting news this morning? Brothers and sisters, rest in that and cling to that and go to that every day of your life, especially when it feels like God does not love you anymore. Of course, if you're here today and you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, this, all this good news I've shared with you has to begin with you repenting and coming to him. So as we will sing in a moment, I encourage you to believe that Jesus died for you. He rose again. And that you will trust in him as your savior. And he will save you. And then all these promises will be for you. Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we can't say enough about how thankful we are. And how much we love you for how much you have loved us. I pray this morning, Lord, especially for anyone who's going through difficult times. Through heartache through times they don't understand. They can't see how the evil in their life can bring about anything that's good. I pray especially for them, Lord, that this message today would give them comfort to know that you care for them, you love them, and you are with them and will never leave them. And you are working this out in their life for good. I pray, Lord, that we would trust you when we don't understand how the evil in our life can do that. And I pray that we would trust you when we see our world and can't understand how this is going to be good someday. I pray, Lord, we'd be like Job and learn that you know what you're doing and you are in control. And so as we close our service today, Lord, by worshiping you in song again, I pray we would humble ourselves and come to you and respond to what you have spoken to us today. And I pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing a time of worship, but also a time of response. I'll be here to pray with you for any need that you have. Or if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior today, I'll be here to, to tell you how you can do that. So let's sing and let's respond.
shadows disappear and my faith shall be my eyes Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed the victory is won pray and we'll be dismissed. Lord, as we've gone through this book of Romans, we've seen the state of mankind apart from you, but even more than the state of the world, we've seen our hearts, we've seen our souls apart from you. We've seen that we have have hated you, we have sinned against you, and all these horrible things we have done because we have despised our creator. But you have been mindful of us, you have loved us uh, unconditionally, us that have have put our faith in you. We are thankful for your son. We're thankful for the sacrifice and and the cross. And I pray that as we leave here today, uh, we do go out with the mindset that we are more than conquerors, not because of what we have done, but because what Christ has done for us and in us. So we thank you for that. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.